sometimes it's where our mind goes, you know, when we are confronted with the unknown or any kind of change. So I thought today that I would talk about appropriate attention. Um, the Buddha says that in a certain sense, we create our own reality. In other words, like if I think there's a boogeyman outside the door, that's real to me. So there's a boogeyman outside of the door of my mind. And so I respond in a certain way uh, in light of my view that there is a boogeyman outside the door. So in this way, uh, we create uh, uh suffering where there are just circumstances. It's how we choose to evaluate it that determines whether the circumstance actually will uh, inure to suffering for us or not. <clears throat> Sometimes we call it something as simply as, well, just planning, just making sure we have all our bases covered, but we actually cannot cover all of our bases. We just have to be self-possessed enough that Whatever comes, we uh, can be focused at that and we can do our best in every situation. That's all that is required of us. And then things are going to be whatever they be, whatever they are, dependent upon how each person that is connected to that situation thinks. That's why it's important, you know, <clears throat> I used to, I remember my, uh, in my early running days, I loved uh, church on Sunday, but I also liked partying on Saturday. And uh, <clears throat> and the pastor was always preaching about those people who hung around in the middle of the night, like uh, like uh, like all the other crawly things that come out. And I said, oh, "She she preaching on me, you know, <laughs> because I like to hang out." And she said, she went on to talk about there's nothing useful that you could be doing in the middle of the night, you know, um, that, uh, and, and how people got in a lot of trouble creeping around at night and got in, in a lot of situations that if they'd been at home sleep, maybe they wouldn't have gotten, they wouldn't have gotten into. And, and so I used to take it personally because I was one who liked being out, uh, at night, you know, um, and I was one who slept a lot during the day and so one day I was talking with her. I said why do you have to give a Dharma talk on me every Sunday she said I'm not giving a Dharma talk on you I'm just telling you how things are like if the shoe fits that's all that's all I'm saying and but now I so I remember those kinds of of uh, stories or the kinds of ways she was relating to things because I'm understanding it in a different way. Actually, I got so upset with, with uh, it was a trio of, of pastors and there was one who was a woman and, and she just really didn't like me at all. And I kept trying to make her like me, you know, and, and I couldn't, couldn't make it couldn't make it happen. So she was always giving these Dharma talks and it was, and it seemed like it was directly about me. But now I realize it was just really about the nature of things. And actually, if the shoe fits, then the shoe does fit. Now I'm looking at how I approach everything minute by minute and what my response will be to it. And my response is according to how I see what is happening or how I hear what is happening or how I understand what is happening from my own side. Now that side can be a combination of things. It can be a combination of memory. It can be a combination of conjecture. It can be uh, a combination of, of uh, uh, experience. It can be a combination of non-experience. It could be, uh, I'm not feeling well today. It could be, I don't like the people who are doing it. It could be any number of things, but still this mind and the visceral feelings in the body organize and create the structure of that appearance for me. And so, uh, so we can be in a really peculiar situation about how to walk through the day-to-day -day vicissitudes of, of life. And how we walk through it affects those that are, are with us. And so it's not always about setting an example, you know, it's about really being free 
yourself. You know, it's, it's about really from the inside out understanding, uh, how you, uh, move and have your being in, in life. And when it is really there, then there's not anything that you can't conquer in the sense of not necessarily always winning the outer battle, but by not being uprooted, uh, destabilized or discouraged from the inside, because that's where our true life exists. And so when we see all of the things happening in the world today, we can understand that that's what is outpictured. That's what's in the hearts and the minds of uh, human beings, of and not just human beings, in the hearts and minds of living beings. You know, there are other beings besides human beings, right? I mean, we don't think in this whole gabillion galaxies, the only thing that exists are animals, uh, microbes, you know, viruses, bacteria, and, and human beings. I, we don't need all that space for just that. There are other, there are other beings, not only out there, there are other beings close, uh, right, right here. But if you haven't seen them, you don't know that, that they are there. It's just like the frog, uh, and the, and the fish. And they play around in the pond, and then the frog hops up and he disappears for a while. And when he comes back, the fish says, where you been? He said, I've been hopping around land. He said, land? What's that? You know, and he had no frame of reference for land because the fish had never been on land. But it doesn't mean that there isn't land. It just means that, that the fish had no no reference for land. So he couldn't fathom, couldn't understand what that was. But the one who can knows there absolutely is land. So... So the things that we haven't encountered, haven't experienced, haven't known about, we shouldn't say, oh, like, I don't believe in that. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. We just say, I don't know anything about that. That's sufficient, you know, because there will come a time or can come a time that you can know something about it. It depends, some Buddha said, on if one should wish to know. Some things we don't want to know. We don't want to know because we've already, like, got our nice little neat box about how life is and what things are, and that's sufficient. That's enough for me. I'll take it the good, the bad, and the ugly, but I feel some sense of control if I have defined what is reality, and we go with that. But it causes us so much suffering, and it causes others so much suffering. So the first thing I need to do is uproot that which causes me suffering. That means my own mindset, my own understanding of things. And then the second thing is not to let uh, someone else's deficiencies uh, thwart me. That's our practice. So you see, it all falls back to ourselves, not relying on others. That's why he said, I'll rely on yourself. Do not rely on on others. And it doesn't mean that we don't, we don't lean into the wisdom of others, that we don't experiment with the suppositions of others. But it does mean that in the final analysis, Paniwadi is responsible for Paniwadi. And you're responsible for your, for yourself. So if life's not working out for you, you have to look inside and see what adjustments do I need to make that will make, uh, my life more meaningful for me. And then uh, when people make this choice, you have to allow them to make that choice. You might not see it, but you don't have to see it. It's not your life. It's their life. But each one of us, the, you know, that's the good news to me. That is, if, if I could call it the gospel, that's the gospel for me, is that I'm not helpless, neither am I dependent upon anyone else for my happiness. So sometimes I'm not happy. But that's nobody's fault but mine. You know, if I cannot um, uh, separate, you know, uh, the, if I don't know or cannot recognize the difference uh, between occurrences happening and my uh, reaction to them, then that's nobody's fault but mine. And we don't even have to call it a fault. It's just how it is right now. Um, you know, sometimes we 
have to go through something until we like just can't go through it anymore. Then there's the motivation, you know, to do something different. And not until there's the motivation, you know, maybe we couldn't step forward uh, to put forth the effort. Maybe it's like, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I can, I can work with it. But then when it gets to the point that I absolutely cannot, there has to be a change, then the motivation is there and we can do something different. So very seldom do we hear any talk in the Dharma about wishing, you know, because we think that's in somebody else's domain. You know, Buddhists, we, we're like, we're pragmatic, you know, uh, we look at things functionally, uh, and wishing is like not in that, you know. But, but actually, if you think of wishing as having a great aspiration, having an aspiration to, uh, to uh, accomplish something meaningful, having um, a desire for something that is uh, beneficial, that seizes the, seizes the essence of a precious human life, makes life meaningful. You know, these are all things we have to decide whether, um, whether it serves any purpose for us or not. And then he said, birds of a feather flock together. So you find people who like, not uh, interested in self-improvement and and they hang together as a group and you find those who uh, who want to make uh, changes who want to do positive things like and they function as as a group so I understand birds of a feather flock together and uh, when one comes into an environment you know because they really are seeking something then we should feel uh, such a gratitude for having uh, a, a space where we can do our own investigation, where we can challenge our assumptions, where we can make changes. The Paniwa you saw yesterday is not the one that you're looking at today, and I hope it won't be the one that you see tomorrow. When we have an opportunity to be in such a place, the, the gratitude provokes a certain sense of responsibility to be our highest and our best, you know, example for who comes in because we know that they're coming in to a refuge. That's why we call it Heartwood Refuge, seeking something and to not uh, uh, get them off their game, to not uh, uh, cause them to lose focus, to not uh, disrupt their uh, intention, uh, we should be very careful, you know, about that. Um, so <clears throat> the reason I mentioned something about beings is because this was a sutta, uh, and, and it involves a conversation with a devata. A devata is something like an uh, uh, elemental being, uh, ones that are, are uh, connected um, karmically to like uh, trees, uh, to water holes, to uh, localities, uh, things like that. And it says, uh, I've heard that on one occasion a certain monk was dwelling among the Kosalans in a forest thicket. Now at that time he spent the day abiding, thinking unskillful thoughts, thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, even thoughts of doing harm. Then the devata inhabiting the forest thicket, feeling sympathy for the monk, desiring his benefit, desiring to bring him to a census, approached him and addressed him with this verse. From inappropriate attention, you're being chewed by your own thoughts. Relinquish what is inappropriate and contemplate appropriately. Keep your mind on the teacher. And here they were talking about the Buddha. He was alive at this time. Uh, uh, keep your mind on the Dharma. Keep the mind on the Sangha. Keep your mind on your virtues, and you will arrive at joy and rapture and pleasure without doubt. Then saturated with that joy, you will put an end to suffering. 
and distress. And it said the monk chastened by the devata came to his senses. And that's in the Samyutta Mikaya. It says there is a case where an uninstructed, ordinary, run-of-the-mill person does not discern what ideas are fit for attention or what ideas are unfit for attention. And this being so, then he does not attend to um, ideas fit for attention and attends instead to ideas unfit for attention. Now, I love the way the suttas are written because, you know, this was an oral language and it was transmitted orally. So they, uh, there was a lot of repetition. Now that it's written, it looks, um, it looks funny and it can read funny if you don't understand the, the, the purpose of the oral the oral uh, transmission. And so even when you're reading it, these kinds of suttas are, are best if read aloud, like the hearing of it, you, you get a uh, better sense of the context. You get a, you know, um, we have to be careful. Uh, we're so busy around here. Like we shoot emails all the time, you know. It's like, you know, if I call and then I'm going to be in a five minute conversation and this is a 15 second you know, issue. So you like shoot an email and then you get an email comes back to you and then you shoot another one. And after all, you have a whole string of emails. But the thing is, sometimes the, um, the message is lost in the emails or the intent, I'll say, is lost because the emails can't exactly convey, you know, what was, um, uh, can't most accurately convey uh, all the uh, uh, fine aspects of a conver of a conversation, and so, or at least for us old folks, maybe young folks can do it because that's all they know is texting back and forth. But for us, we learned how to talk to each other, and something is lost in the conveyance uh, by email. And so, when you read these out loud, though, you get more of a sense of how the uh, uh, com session was going or the instruction was uh, rolling out. And he says, then what are the ideas unfit for attention that he attends to? Whatsoever ideas such that when he attends to them, the unarisen effluent of sensuality arises and the arisen effluent of sensuality increases. The unarisen uh, effluent of becoming arises and the unarisen effluent of ignorance arises and the arisen effluent of ignorance increases. This is how he attends inappropriately. So we're always talking about something coming into existence and that there is a propelling force that brings that or allows that to come into existence and that this is uh, precipitated by the gates, the sense gates, the internal gates that meet external um, um, bases and consciousness arises and the three of these make contact. So the eye sees something and, uh, and, and the ear hears something, the tongue tastes something, um, the body feels something. Um, there's a tactile sensation. What is that? What we see here, taste, touch, smell. Uh, the nose smells something. And then there is that one faculty that in, ties it all together and interprets it. The mind thinks something. And it says, and this is how we form our view of what things are. But sometimes we only hear a snippet. Sometimes we only see a little part of something. Sometimes we see something based on what we think we're seeing instead of what is actually occurring. So, so he said that when we formulate our opinion about what is actually happening, we have to recognize that there is this um, coming together based on uh, of, of, of a view based on sensuality. We think of sensuality maybe like in sexual terms, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, the external basis, 
making contact uh, with the internal basis and the consciousness that arises. And he said, and, and when that happens, with that, with that contact, there is a feeling. The feeling is pleasant or unpleasant. I like it or I don't like it. Or this neutral feeling. I, I neither like it or don't like it. It just, it's something that's happening. And with that feeling then comes a craving. The craving is if I like it, I want more of it. Oh, yay, let's do this. If it's, if it's, a, if the feeling is unpleasant that I don't like it, then I have aversion to it. I want it to go away. And so here we have the internal base. Our sense gates meet the external base. Whatever we see here, taste, touch, smell, or think. Uh, consciousness arises. That's the forerunner or the creator of consciousness. I didn't have a consciousness about that thing until that internal base and that external base connected. Then consciousness arose. And the three of those made contact. And with contact came a feeling. And that feeling was pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And with that feeling came a craving. I wanted to stay. I want more of it, or I want it to go away. I don't want, and the clinging sin that brings about the whole ball of wax for our suffering. Now, how many of us, when we are suffering, can look beyond our momentary suffering and do the math? I mean, like count this up, okay? Internal basement, external consciousness arose, three of those made contact with contact, came feeling. By the time you finish that, that whole issue is like done for. You know, you don't even have to worry about that anymore because you just realized that it wasn't that that created your suffering, but it was that whole process that you went through internally that created that suffering for you. But after a while, you can do like a zip, you know, because cause you know the road there. You know what brought that up. And I'll tell you, this is not overnight. He said this is a gradual training. Just because intellectually we get it doesn't mean that we can like... uh Take care of it. Like, it's, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it. I know it. It doesn't mean that at all. It just gives us something to uh, use, like, as a litmus, something that we can go back to again and again when we're contemplating, you know, our unhappiness or our confusion or our frustration or our anger or our sadness, you know, and that is the only path, the only way of uprooting it, coming back to a stable, uh, a stable position where we don't have to be moved either way. It doesn't mean that we don't have to take action. Does sometimes there's something to do, and sometimes there's nothing to do. You got to know which one, and if you don't, you'll find out whether you know you were right or not. <laughs> So sometimes we go to take action before we have stabilized and and can arrive at a at a neutral or impartial view, you know. And then sometimes when we do, we are afraid to take action. Why? Because we're afraid of death, even when it's something we don't like. We are afraid of the death of anything. And that's why the Buddha talks so much about impermanence. If you just think of impermanence, just scratch out the word death and just substitute it for impermanence. Because that's all it is. We can't be afraid of dying because if we, if we think of dying or death as the end, then how do you know? There's nothing beyond that if you think of the of the death being the hard part, it's the change, it's the impermanence, it's the not knowing that we are afraid of. So we are of afraid of uh, the the not knowing what's going to happen next, and there is no way to go to the next moment except to be there when it arrives. There's no way we're going to fix that. It goes with this human experience. And so we can spend our whole life in avoidance over the uncertainty of the next moment. Or we can 
recognize that there is no certainty or security to be had anywhere. And when we do, we can take each day for what it offers. That's that's just grown up. That's and with that comes a certain freedom. We always talk about when we were children and and life was free and life was carefree and then we grew up. But actually, this is the carefree uh, life if we have the courage to enter into it. This is the time that we can truly make life meaningful, that we can use the skills and the wisdom that we have amassed along the way, what to do, what not to do, if we didn't spend all of our time wrapped up in the fear of what might happen because there's a change. So my advice to you is to be very careful where you focus your attention. Nobody can do anything about that for you but you. I want to close with um, a passage from the Greater Discourse to Sachaka. I was looking for it uh, last night, and I asked Panya Deepa, you know, like, could he remember uh, where to find this particular sutta, uh, which which one of the canons, and and where in in the canon? He said, "I'm sorry, Panyawadi." He said, "I can't remember where to find all of them now." You know, like my head just doesn't give me that instant recall. I said, well, don't feel bad about that. I'm asking you for the for my favorite suit that I can't remember where it is. So uh, that just goes with the that just goes with the turf. And then I opened the book, and it's dog-eared now because I dog-eared it last night. But I just opened this big book, and I opened it not to the page where the paragraph was, but I actually opened it to the next page, and I was reading something on the next page, and I said, um, well, that is really good. You know, you can just open any page and start reading it. All of it's good. So I looked at this and said, well, this is really good. And I decided to go back a little bit further to read what came before that page, <laughs> and there it was, one page before the very uh, sutta that I was looking for. And, and in this sutta, uh, this is when the Buddha was recounting, you know, all the austerities he went through trying to, uh, to wake out up and to try to understand the nature of reality and trying to free his mind from the suffering that comes from, uh, um, just our ordinary ignorance about how things are and our unwillingness, our resistance, you know, to accepting how things are. And that doesn't mean that everything anybody wants to do is okay. But what I'm saying is recognizing that we cannot control, but to a very small extent, the external world, but we absolutely can control our response to it and how we let it affect us, you know. Uh, and so he was talking about while he was on this search and how he tried everything, you know, with all the teachers and he studied all the different spiritual dis disciplines in his country that was available at that time. And, and every, no matter what he did, he'd get so far and then his discontent would come back. No matter what he did, uh, he, he would go so far and then his fears would come back. No matter what he did, he would, he would find some relief, but then there would be a new fear that arose and, and he didn't know what to do about that. Um, <clears throat> and so he went, uh, into a very ascetic 
form of life that caused him uh, a lot of suffering, even physical, bodily suffering. That's why I say to people, don't be trying to sit on the pillow. If the pillow is making your knees hurt and your back hurt, sit in a chair. You know, um, when we were training, we were told, sit on that pillow. And, and when the pain comes, don't move. I mean, I know monks today who have, I don't know what you call it, where their legs are, are swollen, where they cut off the circulation in their legs because they were afraid afraid to move. But I say that if you're in a position and it hurts, change. Just move to a different position. That's all you have to do. You don't have to make a big deal about it. You don't, you, just, you just adjust. Even when we're sitting, sometimes we think that we're we're sitting in a relaxed uh, or or posture. Then after sitting there for a moment or or, or two minutes or three minutes, we find like maybe I was a little uh, tight or stressed out bodily when I first sat down, and I have to make that adjustment. Then you make you make that adjustment. That's it. And so he went on to talk about all the things that he did. Like he stopped eating. He got down to where he was eating one grain of rice a day. You know, because some people say you know. Uh, um, Slay the appetite and realization will come. And some people said do this and some people said do that. And he was doing pranayama. He was, he was messing with the breath and, and alternating nostrils. And he was doing, he was doing all these kinds of different, um, yoga things that was pre prevalent, uh, <clears throat> in his country in that day. And that's somewhat prevalent even today, even in our country. And he said, you don't have to do all that. He said, you just breathe naturally. Just breathing in and breathing out, being aware of the air flowing through the nostrils. And just taking those three in breaths and out breaths. Already, there is a shift. Already something starts to happen. Already there's a, a chemical effect in the body. Just turning one's attention to the in-breath and the out-breath. Hormones are released that begin to calm and, calm and still the mind. It feels good for maybe a minute, maybe 30 seconds. But then the mind starts thinking, hey, hey, I'm supposed to be doing something. Where's my job? What am I supposed to you know, and, and then the drama starts going. And then I'm right back into the place I was in before. So I have to train. He said breathing in and breathing out. We train. Reestablishing. A platform of this kind of ease that will allow the body to function op optimally and do its job. We don't have to take Xanax and things like that. We can, this can be our medicine. And when those endorphins start to release in the body, then you notice that not only does the mind start to calm and become stabilized, but also the body does too. There's a different feeling in the body. Suddenly, I realized, like, I was uptight. My shoulders were hunched, and I couldn't drop them. But before they didn't feel hunched, they were like, I'm just walking around like this all the time. Yeah. I feel it. Ah, oh, that's so tight. <laughs> I could just drop it and just ease into that position. Suddenly I can realize that I was up here breathing in my chest. <sighs> and now I, I relax in it and there's something, it like just drops. And just like when I'm laying in bed and, and your abdomen is rising and falling. Just check it out tonight. When you lay, your chest is not heaving. Just the 
rise and fall of the diaphragm. So this is a, a contrived way that we all choked up up here. But just allowing you to relax. I mean, a lot of us, especially women, we went around trying to suck in our stomach so we have little teeny waist for so long. Or maybe the men, too, because they're walking around with the, with the puffed-up chest. You know, I don't know. That we become soft. Not trying to control anything. Just being with what is happening. And as we do this over and over, we find that it transfers into how we're moving in our daily life. Not rigid and staunch. Not trying to control everything or plan everything even. But being available, fully available to show up. And when we show up, we're not tired because we put so much energy into thinking that wore us out. We show up refreshed, ready for whatever challenge is there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he said, <clears throat> after doing all of those things and finding out that they didn't really work, and that looking at all the things I thought were pleasurable out here in the world that actually along with the pleasure, or shortly after the pleasure, came discontent or unhappiness. And I tried to put away pleasure then, like, pleasure, bad. You know. He said, in practicing this way, I began to discover something, a different kind of pleasure, a kind of pleasure that wasn't dependent on what was happening out here. A kind of peace, a kind of ease that with cultivation I could enter into regardless of what was happening out here. And I thought to myself, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with the world? There's nothing to do with the information I have taken in from the sense gates out here. And why I'm afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with unwholesome mental states. I thought, I am not afraid of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with the world and it has nothing to do with unwholesome states. And so this is a path of cultivating wholesome states. Choosing to change our mind, literally that's what it is. It's when Something comes up, something like breaks, like in hardwood, something breaks every day. <laughs> something breaks every day, you know. And when it breaks, I can be glad that at least I have it. It might need fixing, but I have it. Just finding something in every situation to be grateful for. No, it takes a lot to run a place like this, especially with so few people. And everything has to have its own time of growth and development. And just knowing that allows you to work with the things that aren't perfect because it takes time both the physical plant and those who abide in it. And knowing that allows those things to be whatever they are. 
and knowing in a few minutes that'll change or tomorrow that'll change or next week or next month because everything changes. And using that time to better decide what could I do that will make the change when it comes be more beneficial. And if we develop this kind of attitude, even when we are in the throes of a great challenge in our lives, we won't be utterly overcome by them. We learn how, how they teach it, tuck and roll. We learn how to tuck and roll. Be a lamp unto your own feet and a light unto your own path. He said, if it was not possible, I would not have told you. But because it is possible, I encourage you. May you be well and happy and peaceful. May no harm come to you and no danger. May you always be able to meet with the inevitable difficulties of life. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be happy. Thank you for coming today.